Don't be alarmed, this is not a real Game & Watch. It's episode 5 of Game Boy Works Color. The tortuous release history of Game Boy Color's first party launch lineup is perhaps the greatest evidence we have to suggest that Game Boy Color was something of a hastily assembled stopgap measure to freshen Nintendo's portable lineup in the wake of Virtual Boy's failure and Project Atlantis not being quite ready for prime time. First we had Wario Land 2, which shipped in the US and Europe as a black and white Game Boy title months before the Game Boy Color release, but jumped immediately to a color compatible release for the Japanese system launch. Game & Watch Gallery 2 here is basically the opposite. It shipped in a monochrome-only version exclusively for the Japanese market in September 1997, as Game Boy Gallery 2. But it didn't show up outside of Japan until November 1998 as a color-compatible title for Europe, America, and Australia. To make things even more confusing, the Australian color release was called Game Boy Gallery 3, despite there never having been an Australian release under the name Game Boy Gallery 2. There are a few online resources that claim the mono version showed up in the US, but that appears to be spurious. There are no examples of that release's box art, and reliable digital archaeologists have written off those claims as being an error. In short, it's all kind of a logistical mess, but this game itself is pretty nifty, so all's well. Game & Watch Gallery 2 embraces Game Boy's historic roots, which you can see right there in the title and logo. It harkens back to the Game & Watch system. It's been a while since the works series has touched on Game & Watch. Those standalone devices were highly relevant in the very early days of Game Boy, but the console established its own personality and left its primitive forebears behind in short order. Nintendo produced the Game & Watch line from 1980 to 1991, and it was already more or less a curio of history by the time Game Boy debuted in 1989. Nintendo's earliest Game Boy releases felt a lot like upgraded Game & Watch units, and we've even seen an NES game or two that were inspired by the old handhelds. Think Urban Champion, which was based on the mechanics of Game & Watch boxing. Game & Watch designed around limited pocket calculator technology prove the viability of portable gaming built around cheap parts. Without it, there never would have been a Game Boy. And inevitably, over the course of Game Boy's lengthy existence, Game & Watch went from being a Neanderthal embarrassment to a legacy worth celebrating. Thus, the Game & Watch Gallery series, which debuted in 1997 on Game Boy and ran until a fourth release which shipped in 2002 for Game Boy Advance. Collectively, this was one of Nintendo's first proper attempts to truly celebrate its own gaming heritage, something that has since become a central pillar of the company's business. Before Virtual Console, before Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, before the e-reader, and even before Super Mario Bros. Deluxe, there was Game & Watch Gallery. And unlike, say, NES Classic games on Switch, there's a lot to Game & Watch Gallery too, even if the games compiled here are utterly basic. Game & Watch Gallery 2 is cut from the same cloth as Nintendo's one big previous retro compilation title, Super Mario All-Stars. As in that game, it revisits titles from an older platform and reworks them with new visuals and some mechanical tweaks. But this goes several steps beyond what we saw in Super Mario All-Stars, to approach legitimate game preservation status. Here we have five, well, six, old games collected on a more powerful platform. Game Boy couldn't perfectly reproduce the Game & Watch experience due to some fundamental technological differences. Game Boy used a 160 by 144 pixel dot matrix screen to create graphics, which sets it apart from the Game & Watch line. The DMG in Game Boy's product codes stands for dot matrix game. The screen tech was literally a defining feature of the system. The Game Boy screen, benighted as it may be, represented a significant leap over the old Game & Watch with its ability to paint images across more than 23,000 pixels in four different shades of gray. The Game & Watch, on the other hand, made use of a more limited form of display tech. The line's dinky processors could only handle a few dozen potential graphical elements, so the visuals for each game consisted of hand-drawn, composite images silkscreened onto the system's screen. In coming to Game Boy, Game & Watch titles necessarily lost some graphical fidelity. There was no pixelation on Game & Watch images, since they were high-resolution silk screens, and the Game Boy's limited pixel density meant these reproductions had to exist as approximations. Some titles here fare worse than others. Donkey Kong, which originally shipped as a dual-screen clamshell Game & Watch that prefigured the DS, doesn't look so great on Game Boy. In accommodating a view of two screens at once, one screen is highlighted over the other, and both are rendered an almost incomprehensible pixelated mess. Still, Nintendo and co-developer Tose put a lot of love into this compilation. 
if not every title fares as well as you might hope, it seems a fair trade-off for the exhaustive care taken in translating these vintage handhelds into a cartridge form designed to appeal to a new audience with a higher expectation from their video amusements than Game & Watch could realistically deliver. The five games here consist of Chef, Donkey Kong, Helmet, Parachute, and Vermin. There's also the unlockable sixth game, Ball. And for those who really love Game & Watch, you can also use a link cable to import any titles you've mastered in the first Game & Watch gallery and bring them into proper color. The five basic titles here are all pretty simplistic, except for Donkey Kong, which manages to be surprisingly complicated, though not necessarily to its benefit. The other titles are more or less rudimentary action games in which players perform simple left to right or up and down movements in response to a few action prompts. Consider a chef in which you control a panicked chef trying to flip three items of food on a single frying pan. Each morsel bounces into the air before plummeting, and all the pieces fall at a different rate. In order to prevent your meal from splattering on the ground and being stolen by rats, you need to stand beneath each bit of food once it reaches pan height in order to bounce it back up into the air. Adding an extra complication is a hungry cat who lurks on the left side of the screen and will occasionally spear the leftmost morsel with a fork taking it momentarily out of the action before dropping it again. Health code concerns about the chef's restaurant notwithstanding, there's not really much to this game. The challenge comes in getting a feel for the descent rates for each type of food. So you won't get far if you can't learn to predict which item will fall soonest, and thus prioritize your movements. You can also play hard mode, which was mode B in the original Game & Watch handheld. This requires you to manipulate four food items at once. Once you get good at it, you're rewarded for reaching 200 and 500 points, that is, 200 and 500 successful flips, by earning an extra life at each milestone. This is a standard mechanic in most of the Game & Watch titles. Helmet is essentially the inverse of Chef. Rather than trying to prevent falling objects from hitting the ground, you're trying to prevent them from hitting you. An infinite cascade of construction tools rains from above here, and your task is to dash from the safety of a building on the left side of the screen to a shed on the right edge, without taking a hit to the noggin. Adding to the difficulty is the fact that the door you're trying to reach opens and closes at random, so you need to plan carefully to avoid being stranded outside a door that's shut fast. Hard mode here simply causes the tools to fall more quickly and the shed door to open less frequently. But between these two titles, you get a sense of the basic Game & Watch formula. Players typically need to manage three or four primary action elements at once. At the same time, there's usually some sort of external gameplay modifier that has to be contended with as well, such as the sausage spearing cat or the unpredictable shed door. That's not always strictly the case though. In Parachute, a guy in a rescue boat has to move around and prevent parachutists from landing in shark infested waters. The following people are all you need to worry about here, as the shark only becomes a nuisance if you miss a parachutist. On hard mode, the rightmost parachutist will occasionally get caught up in a tree and be delayed in his fall, but that's as complicated as it gets. And Vermin is pretty much whack-a-mole, where three or four moles appear from the ground and need to be bopped on the head to prevent them from doing whatever moles do. Of these games, Donkey Kong is definitely the most unconventional. It's a simplified take in the arcade game, in which you need to ascend sloped girders while leaping barrels. The level layout is far smaller than that seen in the arcade game despite the use of two screens, and your blotchy monochrome rendition of Mario can only jump upward. Mechanically, this stage appears to combine elements of the arcade game's first stage with its fourth. You are ascending girders while dodging barrels, but the win condition involves cutting wires to cause Kong's platform to fall. Tosei and Nintendo did a fine job of bringing over these games to fit within the limitations of Game Boy Color. This hardware made it possible to capture the non-interactive color-printed layout elements on each individual system, and the action of each game feels authentic. Only Donkey Kong really suffers here, with too much happening on screen for everything to read cleanly. But even then you have to admire some of the clever solutions present here, especially the ability to toggle between active screens with the press of the B button. Game & Watch Gallery 2 would feel somewhat slight if that were the extent of what it offers. Yes, these are neat productions of long out-of-print collector's items that by their very nature could never be compiled in a 100% authentic fashion, but it's really just five extremely old handheld games with simple visuals and even more basic gameplay. What makes this compilation so remarkable is everything else it contains. As I mentioned before, there's a Super Mario All-Stars element to this collection. Each and every title also appears in a modern variant that features new graphics and reworks the gameplay to include an added touch of complexity. All five titles here have been given a Mario-themed facelift, meaning that the generic silhouette man who inspired Smash Bros., Mr. Game & Watch has been replaced by Mario, Peach, or Yoshi, depending on the game. Modern Chef stars Peach, Modern Vermin stars Yoshi, and Mario takes the lead in the other titles, although Wario does appear as a sort of easter egg and helmet. Besides the new visuals, which add color and dimension to the primitive Game & Watch look, 
Each modern game contains new music as well. Game & Watch systems were limited to simple clicks and beeps to keep the pace, but here you get some proper musical accompany that also ebbs and flows to keep pace with the sliding difficulty of the games. And on top of that, each game includes new features within the mechanics as well. For example, Helmet introduces a coin element that allows you to rack up a score more quickly. Stomp on a switch and several coins will appear on screen. Each one is worth 3 points, but there's a downside. If you collect too many coins, Mario will be bogged down by their weight and will be slower to maneuver across the screen until he enters the shed and drops off his loot. In Parachute, the rightmost island now houses a cannon. If a parachutist falls into the cannon, they'll be launched back into the field of action after a moment, which is more dynamic and unpredictable than the parachutist who got snagged on the tree in the classic mode. Occasionally, bomb bombs will fire out of the cannon, forcing Mario to evade those hazards while still trying to capture falling toads. Donkey Kong compresses the field of action while adding new elements, including ceiling hooks that Mario can grab onto when he leaps. Meanwhile, Chef and Vermin see significant changes. In Chef, Princess Peach now takes on the task of flipping food, which is tossed into the field of action by Luigi and Mario. There's also an actual cooking element to Chef now. After being flipped a few times, food will become cooked and can be fed to Yoshi, who will reward players with bonuses. And Vermin is so different as to be almost a completely new game. Here, Yoshi defends a set of eggs from enemies that sneak up and attempt to shatter the eggs, which means you need to chase away the hostiles before they manage to land three blows on any one egg. One universal change in the modern remakes is that you no longer receive a 1-up immediately upon hitting a certain score total. Instead, a heart or other icon drops into the field, and you need to snag it in order to earn the bonus. Between modern and classic modes, and each mode's hard and easy play options, every game here appears in 20 total variants. Game & Watch Gallery 2 makes the most of this variety by demanding players master each game in every format and difficulty in order to maximize their experience. See, Game & Watch Gallery 2 contains an extensive museum feature, called Gallery, in which players can unlock various extras. These range from a music player and bonus tracks to the extra playable Game & Watch ball title, along with variant modes. You unlock Gallery features by earning stars, and you earn stars by hitting certain achievements in each individual game. In order to earn the 120 stars necessary to unlock everything in the gallery, you need to master all six included games and earn 20 stars per title. That's far from easy as it includes such daunting tasks as earning a thousand points in all modes and all difficulty levels. But that's not even the full extent of Game & Watch Gallery 2's demands. If you really want to squeeze every ounce of entertainment out of this cart, you need to have thoroughly mastered every title on the first Game & Watch Gallery. If you link two systems containing Game & Watch Gallery and the sequel, you can import all fully mastered titles from the first game into the new cart. And Game & Watch Gallery 3 would present the same option a few years later. It's kind of like carrying a party forward in the old Wizardry games, except a lot more complicated. It's a neat bonus, albeit one that carries a ridiculously high entry price. Anyway, there's not really a lot of substance to this compilation, but Tosei and Nintendo really made the most of it. Game & Watch Gallery 2 is a loving tribute to its own history, one that rewards players for investing their energy and time into mastery, while boldly presenting the idea that old games have inherent value. It's not a bad kickoff for a new system. Next time on Game Boy Works Color, I'm so tired of all these Game Boy Wars.